Hey guys, so in celebration of this channel reaching 5,000 subscribers, I have agreed to answer your questions, and today I'm going to be answering the first of them. Now, just to be clear, all of the tech questions related to Linux and software and all that kind of stuff will be answered on this channel. All of the ones that are not about tech will be answered on my personal vlogging channel, which you can find, if not through a link in the description, uh, through a link on the channel page. So today's question, or rather questions, it's a two-parter, comes from a video fanatic and they ask where's your Vivaldi browser review and what do you think of Arch Linux so this is going to basically be a battle of the browsers video I've been trying out Vivaldi uh, the uh, well it hasn't actually it hasn't actually had a full stable release yet there's a tech preview pre tech preview available which I will of course link to down in the description anyone can try it's available for Windows Mac and Linux um, and today I'm going to be showing my experiences. Now I've used it for the entirety of today. I'm recording this video at the end of the day, but I spent the entire day using the Vivaldi browser. And uh, I'm going to be talking a little bit about my experiences. And then I'm going to sum up with my uh, view on Arch Linux, because I've got a pretty succinct, succinct view on that as well. So although uh, Vivaldi hasn't had an official stable release, I have run into zero bugs, which is... I think there have been one or two like minor sort of things that you barely would even notice but um, for all intents and purposes it's been very very stable very very stable as stable as you'd expect from an actual stable browser release it's very snappy it's very quick but I don't know if that's a bit of a juxtaposition because when I run Firefox and um, Chrome slash Chromium I, I do run them with a fair number of browser plugins which could very well slow the whole thing down so um, it might just be a bit of um, a, a bit of bounce back almost from from just using a browser without any browser extensions it's very very customizable and Vivaldi is geared towards the power user so there are a lot of keyboard shortcuts and a lot of customizable options um, it also does make uh, it very clear that it can do something called um, stacked tabs I think or stacked tabbing and basically the idea is, you know when you've got all the tabs across the top of your browser uh, window, and you know when you can just sort of open just too many tabs, well you can actually stack them, which is putting them into little groups so they take up much less space. Now this can be done on other browsers, but it does require the help of an add-on. This is integral to the browser, and I think that I would like to see significantly more feature-rich browsers, and I think we are moving that direction, particularly with Firefox. I'd, I do appreciate minimalism, and I would, in an ideal world, there would be minimalist browsers and there'd be feature-rich browsers, and they would all live in harmony and get along. But um, but we don't live in that world. Um, but uh, as as a power user, as someone that uses the internet professionally and regularly and recreationally, um, having a feature-rich browser that is also snappy and quick and, and so that would sort of insinuate that I'd like a lot of built-in features rather than uh, add-on ability uh, then yeah Vivaldi certainly looks uh, like it's, it's developed for a power user it's kind of taken on this form of the uh, of Opera as it were you know you of course you'll remember Opera which was a browser that I wasn't particularly thrilled with um, but uh, but then, so this is like the new in, uh, incarnation of it, with a bit more of a goal, a bit more of a direction, a bit more of a philosophy, which is good. Um, so, it can do stack tabbing, it's easy enough to customise, I had no problem actually jumping in and, and running with it. I've never had a problem with any browser, so that's a good, I don't know. Um, and, uh, yeah, snappy, quick, feature rich, um, customizable to a degree. I wouldn't say it's as customizable as Firefox, but then again, like I say, I've only been using it for a day. It is pretty darn good. Uh, obviously there aren't as many add-ons and I haven't really explored the app stores or anything like that surrounding it. Um, I would imagine once it's, and, and, and to be honest, that's probably for the best because the app stores are going to be the thing that are the most unfinished pre a stable release, so... Uh, so there's that. Um, and I think the uh, the app stores could very well be uh, a direct determination of how successful it is as a browser. And I don't hear... I only hear techie people talking about it. That was... That's the thing. When Firefox was up and coming, people that even weren't that interested in computers were sort of noticing it and were sort of... knew what it was. And it might be because Firefox was the first main challenger to Internet Explorer back in the the days when significantly more people used uh, used Windows, um, and particularly a lot of people used it in, in schools because they were they given out free licenses to Windows 95 in schools, which is pretty much one of the main reasons why Windows is as, as successful as it is today. Is because when Windows 95 was released, they just 
basically gave it out free to schools and then they just taught a generation of school children how to use windows and not uh linux unix minix bsd it was uh, it was it was clever it was aggressive and it's it was very savvy but and it cemented them as a company so you know it's a cemented them as a company in in a pretty in a pretty monopolist position anyway i am digressing um so what do i not like about it uh well it, it does seem to actually lack some customizability features um and i'm not entirely sure i don't want to be too harsh on it because again it's not a full release and i have no doubt we'll start seeing more features on it um and they're, li they, they're very much little features. I, I couldn't work out how to... So if you... You know you right-click and open um, a link in a new tab? I couldn't work out how to do that in the background. It always switched focus to the tab that I right-clicked, open as a new tab, and things like that. Um, but there really is only... But but I do actually like it. And I, I to be honest, I could imagine myself using it. If it's as stable as it looks, if it's as snappy... Uh, you know, if it, if it retains its snappiness, if it retains its crispness, um, I didn't make much use of the keyboard shortcuts, and I probably wouldn't because I'm used to mouse-based browsing. Um, but the more I use it, the more I might slip into using the keyboard shortcuts, and I think that could be quite good. Uh, a lot of it is very similar. A lot of it's very, very much what you're used to. So it's not. Um, it's not a whole new world. It's not massively revolutionary about it. If if it didn't ever come to fruition, if the, if if one reason or another the stable release didn't actually end up getting released, the world probably wouldn't miss it. Um, it doesn't bring that many revolutionary features to the table that make it awe inspiring. It's very good at what it does, but it is kind of reinventing opera. Uh, it is better than opera. It looks nicer than opera. It's got more features than opera, uh, and it's got a clearer direction than opera. But why? But but why am I? I talk about it like I'm not particularly enthusiastic about it. If it's really all that good, if it's stable, if it does everything I want to do well, the catch is that it ain't open source. Now, I am not the biggest open source um, maniac you'll find. I'm not. Um, I, I you know I'm not like a uh, uh, like an you know like a, like a a person that adamantly runs free software only on their computer. But I like to run as much open source and um, FOSS software as possible. So I usually allow myself rules for things like Codex, if I want to play DVDs, yada yada, stuff like that. I usually allow myself games, because games are pretty straightforward, and I can even understand, like their proprietary licenses I can understand, quite possibly would even agree with. I think that because games are... They're about as close to disposable software as you can get, at least with the majority of games. The majority of games that I play all the way through, I will not play through a second time. If I play through a game a second time, that means that I really, really, really like the game. So uh, once I've bought a game, and when I buy a game on Steam or whatever, I expect to play it once. That's the number of times that I would, be, that I would feel that I got my money's worth if I finished the game, basically. Um, and then I'd consider anything beyond that a bonus. Um... There is that case of Flash, and I do, um, I do have Flash installed, and I don't like it, and I, I can't wait for the day when I can get rid of it. Um, and that day is getting, it's, it's creeping closer. It's creeping closer. But I got to admit, Firefox is really dragging their heels in supporting um, media source extensions. I think is what it's called, and encode, encrypted source extent. Yeah, media source extensions and uh, encrypted source extensions, which are. Um, basically ways of running video uh, that are not flash is the long short of it um, there are there are DRM issues with it that they're trying to navigate around but to be honest on even on on Firefox's case it's it's getting a little bit embarrassing they keep saying that they're gonna bring out support for it in the next release or the next release or the next release or the next release and they've been saying that they will start supporting it for a while now and and we're still kind of waiting on it. It does seem to be getting closer and nearer to the day, you know, every day. Of course it would do, but um, but Firefox are... are they're, 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 Chrome is eating their lunch, basically. Firefox is that open source browser. It's the one that everyone's t everyone turns to, and it's, and it's losing hand over fist. Could it lose to Vivaldi? Well... Vivaldi focuses itself at the, uh, uh, at the power user. Now, is a power user also a 
a techie user, a, a real geeky user. And the question, and, and the answer to that is probably sometimes. Uh, there are power users that use the internet who don't know much about what goes on under the hood of their computer. They will be, you know, they're, they're the kind of people that will use, uh, you know, they'll be, they'll grow very fond of brands. They'll know brands very well and they'll come to rely on their, their Adobe Premiere or their Sony Vegas or whatever like that. And, and they'll come to, to, to enjoy their little rituals of, of how they do their daily work. Um, and they won't really question that much about their software. And, and the most questioning that they'll do is if uh, a software line that they used gets discontinued and they have to find something to replace it. Um, and then, yeah, there are people that sort of question about the stability and the security and um, the longevity of the software, the um, the philosophy of the company that produce, a bit of, uh, produce software. And a lot of these people tend to prefer open source over proprietary for a number of reasons, and particularly browsers particularly browsers because this because open source allows you uh, and allows the, uh, the, the community or whatever community that browser is a part of to actually uh third party test it third party analyze it to check it for spyware malware bugs instability um and everything else in between. It's a very good way of, of keeping an eye on the security of a browser. It's very good at keeping an eye on things like the privacy features and so forth. Also, companies that open source just tend to be more um, on the up and up. They tend to be better companies. They tend to be more consumer friendly, more consumer focused. They seem to be they're, they're more willing to listen to their communities. They're more willing to abide by a philosophy rather than sell out for profit. And the reason for this is is because a lot of companies, I, I use the word company quite loosely, I'll be honest, because a lot of companies that produce open source software, namely Mozilla and Firefox, aren't really companies, but rather non-profit organizations that aren't charities. I, I suppose it depends what you consider a charity, to be honest, but I wouldn't call Mozilla a charity, even though you can say that they're kind of enabling universal access to the internet, which can lead to things like um, education and, and, and so forth, um, and, and stronger communication and, and, and bringing communities together. Um, and that could, in, in theory, be seen as, as charitable work, but it's not, it's not providing water to a village that, that, that desperately needs it. Um, but, uh, yes, and because Mozilla is, is, is not so much driven by profits, but rather um, the desire to, um, the desire to, to, to create software and, um, and that it's run and its income comes from numerous other sources. Um, rather than actually having to pay for the software uh, itself. And it works really, really well, and it's used, of course, uh, in the Tor bundle. Um, and if the Tor uh, folks are using it, then you know that Firefox is on the up and up. Um, so, yeah, people that really want to know under the, you know, what goes on, on under the hood of their software are probably not going to find Vivaldi that uh, appealing. I would love to use Vivaldi, but... It is proprietary, and there is a bit of a sad thing about Vivaldi as well, is that their, their attitude uh, towards um, coming into the market uh, marketplace, not so much the marketplace, but into the into the in, you know coming into the world of other browsers and, and internet software, is that Vivaldi is constructed almost exclusively, as I understand it, from open source libraries. It's a JavaScript library, which was, funnily enough, uh, open sourced by Facebook, I believe, and then most of the other libraries come from Chromium. Um, and to be as harsh as I could possibly be to it, Vivaldi is really just a reskin of Chromium. And I don't know if um, they, like, it's really the best thing in the world to take all these libraries put a skin on top of it and then um close it off to the world um you know i, th I think that it's kind of like the the sort of the gentlemanly thing to do would be to to keep it open source um and i think that they're doing it they're doing it to protect their intellectual property and they could very well there could very well be a profit motive in it because um because Vivaldi is more of it's it's more of an enterprise than sub, something like Mozilla, um, so yeah, there are a few problems I have with Vivaldi. Those problems are not with the software or browser itself; they are with the philosophy and the attitude of the company. If it changes, then my view of it changes. But as it currently stands, I don't think that a non-free browser is something that I would like to 
use or endorse uh, particularly heavily, and it's something that I'd only use if I had to. For example, um, using Chrome on Linux if you need an up-to-date version of Flash. That would be like the kind of exception. If Firefox released a particularly buggy version, then sw switching over to Chromium would be ideal, because that's open source, but uh, Google is a company that doesn't open source that much of what it does, and it still hasn't got a Google Drive client for Linux. Um, but... Um, that aside, yeah, Vivaldi, technically, I mean, from a user standpoint, it's good. From a technical standpoint, mm-hmm. And, um, and I think that it is just a re... It does seem like a reskin of Chrome. Um, and the UI... Uh, I'm, 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 I've got to admit, I'm reasonably happy with the UI of both Firefox and Chrome. Um, Firefox can um, install enough extensions to make it very similar to Vivaldi and I understand that that can kind of reduce the stability of a browser but um, you're not going to use all the features of, of Vivaldi so you'll only probably want to end up installing a handful of one or two uh, and uh, there's nothing to say you couldn't do that with Chrome or Chromium either so um, so I will not be using Vivaldi post today I'll keep it on the system and probably look back on it from time to time it's easy enough to install you get given a .deb uh, exe and whatever mac os are using i can't remember if it extends to the rpms um it might do it might not do don't hold me on that um but yeah vivaldi huh. um yeah it's kind of like it's it's good but it, it really needs to be open source out of all the software on my computer that i would like to be open source uh, well, I mean, obviously, there's things like the kernel, desktop in, uh, environment, and all that kind of stuff. But beyond that, in terms of day-to-day -day usage of applications and so forth, it would definitely, you know, browser is up there with one of the things I would most like to be open source because it does. It is my, um, it is my sherpa through the internet, as it were, or certainly the World Wide Web, and it's it's what I use to communicate with other people, and I want to have that degree of transparency there. That's just me. Maybe I'm quirky. Maybe other people on the channel feel the same way. Please let me know, of course, down in the comment section below. Apologize for something of a rambly review, but as this channel go, you know, this is a channel where I like to expand on what I view, uh, you know, expand on my views, and I like to draw on your views as well, and I often go on tangents to illustrate the context of um, of what I what it is that I say. I also like the one takes as well because they're a little bit more organic. They're a little bit more conversational. Just the way it's just the way I like these things. Um, almost like a one-person podcast. You could look at these kind of vlogs, I guess. Um, so the next part of the question was, "What do I think of Arch Linux?" What do I think of Arch Linux? Someone who primarily does Debian-based distribution reviews. What do I think of Arch Linux? Uh, I think it's actually really fantastic. I think that Arch Linux is for <sighs> Different Linux distributions do different things. For what Arch does, and for the niche that it fills, it fills that niche as well as you could expect it. It fills that niche very, very well, and regularly surpasses expectations in the quality of the community, which also not only uh, are fantastic um, at at getting things written down in a formal way in, in like wikis and 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 appearing on forums as well. Um, but also um, um, just in, in, in helping non-Arch um, users. They, the, the, the Arch wiki explains so much beyond just the Arch operating system, and they have helped so many people beyond their um, community, and th that is fantastic. It's, it's a community that I am I'm quite, you know, I, I admire a lot. Um, so the niche that it fills is quite important, though, because it's not a Linux distribution for everyone. When you install Arch, first of all, you need a solid internet connection, as you do with all rolling distributions. Um, you, uh, you, know, you load up your, your network installer, you bo it boots you into the command line. You know, you're kind of on your own. You need the manual printed out there, beside you, or at least on a tablet or something. Um, it's not the most difficult distribution in the world to install. I have installed Arch before. But I've, um, but it, 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 it's, it's hardcore. 
It's designed for people that really want to, to know every bit of software that's on their operating system. And they want the most up-to-date software. And the Arch uh, repositories are the most well-maintained repositories that I've ever seen. I am very, very impressed with how they maintain them. I guess with the rolling distribution, that's kind of part of the, uh, part of the, the benefit of using it, part of the reason why you'd want to use it. Uh, the Arch repositories include things like Open Broadcast Studio, uh, Steam, I believe, but please correct me if I'm wrong on that one. I know that it was included in Manjaro, but is it included in Arch? Um, and things like Simple Screen Recorder. Um, could it even be? I, I can't even think off the top of my head, but there is basically you name a piece of software that on, say, Ubuntu or Debian, you'd, uh, well, on, maybe on Ubuntu or Mint or something, you'd have to get a PPA to install an update. Um, Arch probably has it as part of its natural course of, of software, you know, in its repositories. Um, but so, if you, and also, rolling distributions require you to know your operating system better than uh, scheduled distributions. It's a way of the world. I would say that with scheduled distributions, I know that you guys give me a lot of flack for saying that scheduled distributions are not as stable. It it comes with a big caveat. Scheduled, uh, no, yeah, the, the rolling distributions are not stable. And you guys give me a lot of flack for that. And I guess rightfully so, but well, I guess what I should be saying is that rolling distributions are really more for people that know what they're doing. Um, and I think, and not to be too critical of you guys, when you know what you're doing, it's very, very easy to assume that everyone else is going to know what they're doing. But, but they don't. A lot of people are in the dark, and sometimes it's... Um, it's it's difficult to see how far ahead um, you know you've come. Um, so with that in mind, um, Arch does fill the niche of the advanced Linux user that wants cutting edge software, full control over their operating system, not afraid to get into the config files. Would need to be reasonably would need to be comfortable on the command line, and would need to be comfortable with basically reading the known issues page before installing a piece of software. Um, Arch would be very good on a machine that had a specific purpose, so then you only had a limited number of packages that you had to keep an eye out for. Um, highly customizable, very speedy, but then again, that comes again as part of the, the attitude that Arch has of, of only install what you need. Doesn't come with any, it doesn't come with any bells and whistles that you don't use because you pick out everything. It is um, the Lego of operate of Linux operating systems, I guess you call it, and everyone likes Lego. Well, Lego is maybe a bit easier to use than Arch. <laughs> maybe, maybe if uh, Debian was Lego, like Arch would be like Meccano or something. Um, that being said, yeah, Arch is is fantastic at what it does. If you are not part of um, that niche, you probably will stay stay well away from Arch. <laughs> But the guys at Arch know what they're doing, or the guys that use Arch and the guys that are involved with Arch, they know what they're doing, they're very good at what they're doing, and I think the entire Linux community does owe them a debt of gratitude for their fantastic um, documentation of various bits of software that extend, of course, far beyond um, Arch itself. So that's about it for me today. Thank you very much for a wa uh, watching, although I guess most of you have probably been listening more over anything else. Um, that's about it for me today. I will see you soon with another question. Until then, I've been Chris Ware, and you've been awesome. Take care now.